Benjamin Franklin once said that democracy is two wolves and a lamb voting on what to have for lunch. That quote reflects the Founding Fathers' importance and the importance they placed on a system of checks and balances in the Constitution. It also reflects the fears they had that democracy would become mob rule with 51% of the people infringing on the, on the rights of the other 49. In the original draft of the Constitution, the U.S. Senators were elected by the State Legislature and the House of Representatives were, were elected by the district, by the populace of the district. Due to, Senate, uh, due to State Legislative deadlocks and popular support by the Progressive Movement, eventually the 17th Amendment was ratified in 1913, giving the Senators power to be elected by the direct population. It is my claim of fact that the direct election of U.S. Senators has a significantly negative effect on the American political system. Because the direct, A, the direct election of U.S. Senators removes an important part of the checks and balances system, and B, it promotes mob rule, where the rights of the few are infringed upon by the will of the many. My first point is that the direct election of U.S. Senators removes an important part of the checks and balances system, the check of the federal government by the state government. Research by Professor Sean Gilmard and Professor Jeffrey A. Jenkins of UC Berkeley and University of Virginia, respectively, shows that directly elected U.S. Senators are less responsive to states' needs than ones elected by the state legislature. They did a study in which they tallied votes from 1880 to 1940 on state and national issues, and they conclusively said that we can only say that Senators appear to be less constrained by factors in their state political scene after the 17th Amendment before. And since these state governments have little representation due to the unresponsiveness of their senators, federal mandates put down by, by the federal government are put on a great burden on the, state, on the state government because the state government has no representation in the federal government. The St. Louis Federal Reserve Bank, in their quarterly publication, The Regional Economist, did a study on these federal mandates, and they say that at times, projected costs of these mandates for state governments can be extremely high. For example, Tennessee reported that in fiscal year 1992, the cost to the state of all existing mandates enacted since 1987 was $126 million, or only 1.3% of its annual budget. By fiscal year 2002, these same mandates are expected to cost Tennessee $240 million each year. Now, the research is a little old because this publication was out in uh, 1993, but the concept is still the same, that without representation in the federal government, state governments are passed down federal mandates they must pay for themselves. Sometimes the federal mandates are funded, but when they are, it's usually, the cost is usually underestimated, and then also the federal government doesn't pay what they promise. The, the, the regional economists found that a law ordering coastal states to test beach water regularly illustrates it. Congress was willing to contribute some money and authorize $3 million in grants to cover the cost, a representative from Florida complained, however, that it would take two million a year to test the 8,500-mile Florida shoreline alone. That left them less than one million for 20 other coastal states. In addition to making federal mandates and passing laws, the federal legislative body can also veto or approve judges appointed to the Supreme Court. And because judge decisions from the Supreme Court directly affect states most of the time, their, their decisions that they pass down don't represent democracy, they represent a type of feudalism. In McDonald versus City of, City of Chicago, decided in June 2010, the Supreme Court held that the gun ban in Chicago was illegal, yet the state of Illinois had no say in who was going to be appointed to that court or who was going to be vetoed from that court. And, and it, especially when a court decision involves the state paying out money to, to the plaintiff, it can be especially burdening on the state because the court doesn't have the power to raise money and the state government will have to pay for it. My second point is that the direct election of senators allows for democracy to be replaced by mob rule. The study by Gail Mark said that the state legislators are better at monitoring U.S. actions and positions better than the average voter, allowing for a closer eye on issues of importance and increased productivity. Though voters can set the bar higher and demand better standards, it's very hard for a voter to know exactly what the position of a senator is or if they're keeping their promises. 
they found that the amendment clearly made senators responsive directly to state electorates, so the selection and accountability in office were based on a democratically stronger standard. At the same time, the amendment made senators answerable to relative political novices, so they could not be held to that standard as tightly as they were held to the pre-amendment standard. And having both houses in the federal legislation controlled directly by the mass electorate allows for fear-based legislation like the Patriot Act, passed in October 2001, to be passed without basically any challenge. The vote was 98 to 1. And yet, the act has been criticized as largely unconstitutional since. Senators are worried about being labeled as soft on tear or liberals. But if they were to be elected by the state legislator, they wouldn't have to worry about that. They could be judged on their actions alone, and more analysis could be given to legislation. My claim of fact is that the direct election of U.S. senators has a significantly negative effect on the American political system. Because enacting mob rule, where the will of the majority of the people tramples on minorities, comes into place and because the direct election of U.S. Senators moves an important parts of the checks and balances system, that is the state's check on the federal government. Thank you. All right, I like the quote at the beginning. You did a good job identifying what your claim was. There's an excellent setup of the secondary points. Also, when you're in the body of the speech making your argument, you did a good job labeling those points. And there's some good background information on this process. Your proof is largely dependent on some examples, some of which are kind of old. And uh, the one piece of research talking about what they did between 1880 and 1940, I think, is an illustration of that uh, problem. We might need uh, some more contemporary issues. Uh, you talk about, for instance, the Patriot Act at the end and use that as an illustration, but the link that suggests that uh, state legislatures or the states would not have supported the Patriot Act is not really a uh, part of your argument, and I think that needs to be developed a little bit more. Uh, one thing that might be missing from the argument are some of the main rebuttal issues that uh, jump into my head immediately, and that is the nature of the state legislatures themselves and the problems that were faced there. Um, you know, this seems to largely ignore, you know, it goes with the democracy issue pretty well, assuming that the state legislatures are, in fact, representative of state interests and not representative of special interests. One of the issues, I think, that motivated the progressives in the late part of the uh, 19th century, early part of the 20th century, was the corruption at the uh, state legislative level. And so I think that that's an argument that kind of gets left out of this. Um, you did a very nice job presenting to the audience, you had a good summary at the end of the presentation and I thought you used your time very effectively. Thank you.